Okay, so today starts week five, and NIMS needs to start. We really need to go over it at week six, and then um, we will take the NIMS test on week seven. Generally, what I have you all do is just, um, we'll have a date that we go down there. So everybody's going to go down on the 14th at 8.15, and you go down there, take the test. To go do, take the test at our testing center, you cannot wear a hat, you cannot have your phone, you cannot have jackets, backpacks, any kind of stuff like that. They have lockers outside there where you can put your stuff. Um, you can have a calculator, you can have a machinery handbook, you can have a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. So um, those are the only things that you can have with you. And um, so, I think we'll have what we have. Okay. We, have uniforms we have some with uniforms. Some are still not in, so we'll we'll. Do you want to push it or make it happen? I think we'll just do it. Yeah. So, eight forty-five, and um, <laughs> yeah. So we'll 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 have the bulk of them. So. Hey, did you see they got some of the stuff in? I did. Yeah. Getting closer. Getting closer. Yep. So, um, so you, will, and we'll talk about it more, should have already created a NIMS account. Um, um, so we talked about some of those things on like the very first day um, where you went in and did the code and purchased all of your level one tests. I did that. So, um, if everybody's done that, and if you didn't, then we'll catch it up next Monday. But um, we want to make sure that all of our tests are paid for, ready to go down there. We pay for them. Just we don't. Um, so if you go to uh, just the national nims dot org, mm -hmm. and then just go to login. I think you go to testing center, um, and then you can do, so mine looks a little different than yours, so let me try to make it look like yours. Um, I think you go to purchase, and so, or you can go to take test, and it'll show what tests are purchased or available for you to take. So, like, for me, I would need to go in and purchase. Um, this is what you, you should have done. You should have went in and purchased entry-level machining tests. And then you hit purchase. And then you do pay by account code. You guys remember doing that? I do. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I drug you along doing it, too. Yeah. And then you go to account code. PH47G3, and then verify. It'll verify that those are valid. That's a valid code. And then your shirt's on inside out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought I run feeling weird this morning. Yeah. Yep. Um, so verify the account code. Then. What are we supposed to proceed with? Candidate? That should be your only role that you should be able to have. So this will include all of your level one tests for uh, measurement materials and safety. That's the one that you're doing, and that's actually a section in your book. And then um, job plan, bench work, and layout, turning, milling, turning and milling one, um, and then I think that might be it. Oh, no, CNC lathe operation, CNC mill operation is probably that. CNC mill programming and CNC lathe programming might be that as well. So, all right, everybody else is good. You are figuring yours out. So we will be going through there. I will have put or will be putting in some, let's see, we'll go back to this. Mm -hmm. 
So when we get to module six, here is already a PDF study guide. And you can measure my materials and safety. That's what we're doing. So you can take this as a practice test. It gives you the answers and everything. So, um, you know, you can go down to page 27 and it shows you what all the answers are, but it kind of tells you what. That was what was messing me up. It wasn't paying much study. It was because I thought I could say I could. <laughs> so you can take the test on your own, see how you did. You got to score 80% or higher on it. If you don't, you won't pass. And you can have two shots to take it. If you go, hey, I bet I can figure this out on my way down there or as I go. Like, I don't know how to use a machinery calculator very well, and I don't know how to use a machinery handbook very well. I didn't really pay attention in class. I bet I can figure it out. Nobody's ever figured it out like that. It's, it's not that you can't do it. It's that there's too much information in too short of an amount of time. It's a time test. 90 minutes or something? 90 minutes. The book is this thick. And there's just, it's just, it's just, it's just a ratio. There's just too much volume of information there to find. And if you had unlimited time, I believe that all of you guys could figure it out. But... You only have 90 minutes to do it, and so um, it just, it just, it's a certain amount of time. So you need to know how to use a calculator, you need to know how to do those things, and then, um, and so we'll also be covering some thread stuff. That's when we're going to start to really look in the handbook. So I'll say, hey, figure out what the pitch diameter for a 3816 2A is, and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, what is that? And then you're going to figure it out in the book, and then we'll just find different things in the book. We can do kind of a um, pick and choose in the book. But, okay, so we're going to do today, module five, week five, we have three weeks left, almost done. Then you move into, if you're moving on, then you move into C&C at the second eight weeks. That's actually way more fun. Um, and then that's the sequence from now on. Uh, first eight weeks manual, second eight weeks C&C. First eight weeks manual, second eight weeks C&C. So no matter what you're doing, that's pretty much what it is. And then what's after the C&C? Well, there's four manual classes and four CNC classes. And then there's um, the metrology class. There's a CAM 1 and a CAM 2 class. What's the CAM classes? Um, master, or it's master CAM right now. Are you taking that now? Or you're taking metrology now, right? Yes. So the Master CAM class happens on the opposite days. Are you that Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday? Tuesday, Thursday. So Monday, Wednesday is the um, computer aided manufacturing CAM class. And so it's on the opposite days. Um, so next semester, so it's a 16 week class. You'll get the full, full 16 weeks on it. Next semester it alternates. So it'll be Tuesday, Thursday. And so just two days a week, but it's like an hour and a half each time. And um, we'll draw the part, program the part, run the part. So that to a lot of students is a lot more fun because it's a lot more computer based as they go, you know, and even those students would say they don't like to do the computer stuff, they really would rather draw it than hand program it because it's a lot less visual, like thinking through things. So um, I do a lot of CAM programming, probably 75% of my programming now is CAM programming. When we moved to four and five axis, well, we, when we moved to five axis and live tool, so I got some live tool stuff I'm gonna run today. Um, when we move to five axis and live tools, it's almost impossible to not cam your parts, depending on the severity. So like I've got a part set up on the five axis now. Um, it's not impossible to program by hand. This is probably not going to be right. Oh, no, it'll be right. I mean, I wouldn't make a program that wasn't right, but it would just take time. I wrote the program that's on the UMC using the cam in like 30 minutes. It would take me four or five hours to do it in a different way. So you'll learn the hard way first because that's how you know how to edit code. If you don't know how to edit code, you'll be worthless out of the shop because you'll always need to go to somebody to get the answer. So you need to make sure that you can, you need to know why it's a G0 here, a G1 here, you need to know so um, I got a G3 move and now it won't run after the G3 move. Well, that's because G3 is modal and, and you've got you to move to something else. <coughs> so if you go G3 and the destination, then you do X12, uh, it's going to try to G3. It's going to try a circular move 
to that next thing. It's going to make math won't work out. So it, you just get, you got to know why it's not going to do the thing or why it is going to do the thing. So those things are pretty important. So, um, all right. So today we're going to talk about um, metal comp composition and classification. So some of you guys will dual cover some of these things in metrology. Have you guys used the PMI gun yet in metrology? No. Okay. We'll, we'll bring it out here um, in a little bit. We'll spend a pretty decent amount of time in class today. So we're going to talk about ferrous versus non-ferrous materials. Uh, ferrous metals contain iron. So um, anything that rusts contains some type of iron in it. So it's ferrous. It's also magnetic in some way, shape, or form. So, like, oftentimes people would say, well, stainless doesn't rust, and it's oftentimes non-magnetic. True, but there are also some variations of stainless that are magnetic and that do rust. Stainless is really just a high nickel alloy that is high wear resistance. And so that's what we're really seeing when we're seeing things like, when we're, when we're seeing materials like stainless. Aluminum, it doesn't matter how bad or how hard you work at it, it's not going to rust. It'll corrode, but it's not going to rust, you know, because it doesn't have the ability to do that. So it doesn't have any iron in it. Um, we had some kids in here on Friday, um, eighth graders from Blackwater. And um, these, these kids had, um, they had toured several different programs and they came from automotive, one of the groups. And they had these little, you've seen them before, little screwdrivers, little flathead screwdriver with a magnet on the end. And this girl put it on her braces and it stuck. And I was like, hmm, I would not think that that would stick. I would think that braces would be non-magnetic stainless steel. Because who wants your teeth to rust, right? You know, and I was like, that's odd. But more, most likely there was just the smallest amount in there, but there was enough alloy that it wouldn't rust. Okay, so like at the shop that I came from, we did a lot of underwater stuff. So like we did EDM, electrical discharge machining, underwater. And we would use, we would take tool steels, which are very ferrous, um, and we would run them underwater. But they wouldn't rust because they had such high nickel molybdenum alloys in them. And they just, by the time they were in there, so they were under like 30, 40 hours, um, but they wouldn't rust. Now, sometimes we would coat them with um, like a paraffin-based wax, so they would it would help keep from rusting. Um, and because if they were in there more than 40 hours, they had the potential to rust. But um, they were in deionized water, so um, it was it, the water was like you could get electrocuted in the water. No iron in the water. So it's not like underwater welding where your glide speed mm -hmm. goes downhill really quick. No, it was nothing like that. Um, it's way cooler. Um, yeah, that's the reason I stayed away from welding again. I was like, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's funny because I think that there's some, like, people have this really funny version of underwater welding. I hear people say oftentimes they're like, um, yeah, I want to do, like, full submersion welding. Yeah, and I'm like, underneath a ship. Stand by. I'm like, you want to do submerged welding? And they're like, yeah, yeah. Just I, I love to swim. I love to do all this. I'm like, submerged welding isn't underwater welding. Anyways, it's welding with a, a material over the top of the weld as you go. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, like I could submerged weld right here in this room because it's not underwater. And they're like, oh, okay. I'm like, it's, it's got like a, it looks like sand on top of it. So I'm like, it's totally, we're not, we're apples and oranges, we're not two different things. And they're like, so I just went underwater weld. I was like, okay, so that, now that's good. I know what you're talking about. Now let's go that way, you know, so. The job Corps, they asked me if I wanted to do underwater weld. I was like, yeah, your life basically gets almost a cut in half. Yeah. Yeah, you start in the water. Yeah, and typically people do it for a short amount of time. You know, but I mean, hey, if you're young, I mainly wanted to go out and do scuba certification. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> totally cool. All right, so alloys are what you add to the materials to make them stronger, wear resistant, whatever it is that you need them to do. Okay, 
So then your number system for classifying materials is basically four digits until you get into high alloy stuff and then they combine letters and numbers. So it's typically four digits as long as the carbon content is less than 100% um, and it's non-alloy or no, it's non-tool steel. So alloy would have. So like on rings and stuff, some rings they have the, um, the metal, like the type of material they use to make the ring in the inside of the ring with the numbers and all that kind of stuff. What kind of ring are you talking about? Um, piston or what? An engine piston ring? No, or like, a, like a ring for your ring. Finger ring. ring. Okay, I'm with you. Just trying to figure out exactly what you're saying. Yeah, like so mine says um, inside of it, it just says um, 14 and then a little asterisk. So um, 14 karat gold is what it is. Um, but it's really not. Um, I actually took put it in an electron microscope and um, it's, it's, it's really a small amount of, of gold. And is it gold plated or just gold infused? Nope, still, it's still considered 14 karat gold, full gold, but if it was full, if it was complete gold, I don't want to mess that up with fool's gold. I don't want you to think that I'm saying something different. It would be so soft that if I put my fingers together, it would distort in shape. So they have to add some alloys to it to help it hold its shape. Yeah, some of gold is very soft. Yeah, um, so like if it were to be full, complete gold, like you could just take it and twist it. You know, it would be like that. That's how, how soft it would be. All right, so um, here's when we start to look at our numbering systems that help us to kind of understand what is going on. Um, and so these are ones that we're not, not going to see that much, but when we, what we're going to start to see is numbering systems that look like um, 1018, 4140, um, 8620, different materials like that. So four digits and uh, they're gonna really tell us all that we need to know about them. All right, so ferrous metals include wrought iron, plain carbon steels, alloy steel, tool steels, cast iron, and um, I'm not sure why that says and, but um, so based upon the finish of it, it determines if it's hot rolled or cold rolled. Cold rolled steel is smooth on the outside. Hot rolled steel is what we would often call carbon steel. So if you're on the welding side, they call everything carbon steel. And I'm like, it's odd that you call it carbon steel because it has almost no carbon content in it. And the reason I know that is because if you weld it, it doesn't get hard. If you weld it and it gets hard, then it's carbon steel. So they call it that typically because it's a low carbon or plain carbon steel. And so then the, the lower plane just gets dropped off and then they just say carbon steel. Like it's a Corvette, but people would say vet, right? So, but I mean, it could be a Chevette, but you know, you're, but they just, you're it's saying. Stuff you need TIG welding in it. What's that? You need TIG welding most of that, don't you? What's that? What kind? Uh, well, you're. Low you're carbon steel. No, your low carbon steels are your, your regular angle, your channel, your shapes. Um, when you're, you and most of your TIG stuff, you're in stainless. Thin, thin stuff is oftentimes your stainless stuff. Um, you can sneeze. Uh, Bless you. Your um, uh, sanitary welts are typically stainless because they're so much more dense and you're trying to keep bacteria and stuff out of there. So uh, that's typically what you'll see there. All right, so this is cold rolled steel. Um, a hot rolled steel, HRS, is definitely rougher on the outside. Most of what we'll cut is if we cut in the steel family, um, and we're gonna be cutting cold rolled steel. If, you're, if we cut hot rolled steel, uh, it's really rare because it's so rough on the outside, you have to really break through quite a bit of it to get it to clean up, to get it shiny. Um, hot rolled steel is, has way less stress in it because it's been heated up and it's stayed at a higher temperature for a longer period of time. Uh, cold rolled steel does have a little more tension in it, meaning, if you were to take um, a whole bunch of material off of one side, let's just say we had some two by four and we wanted to bring it down so it was half by four. If you took an inch and a half off one side of cold rolled steel, it'll bow. Okay, because it's, it's, it's just, it just takes all that stress. It's got to go somewhere. Hot rolled steel, less likely to bow. 
You should not take all your material off one side anyways. It's just like if you've ever done much woodworking. Um, generally, you're going to, you're, when you're planing something, you don't plane all the material off one side. You plane off one side, one off one side, one off one side, one off one side. Keep going back and forth. Kind of balance that thing out. Otherwise, you get a board that does like this, and you're trying to get that thing to go, but what you've done is you've created so much stress in it. Do they do that at the middle, like, before it gets to the store all the time, then? So they do. Um, when it leaves the mill, it's probably straight as a board. Um, but you've got so many factors that are coming into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's going to be a comedian. Um, but you've got so many factors that play into it. I mean, yeah, this. They always move from one side to the. Well, mostly out of one factor. Water content, because you're, you're, they're heat treating there. You know, but, but when they go to the mill, I mean, you, when you get, so a two by four is called an S4S because it's squared on four sides. And um, so they mill all four sides of it. But what happens is when it's in that stack, it gets rained on moisture content, sits out in the sun, gets so dry. The lagoon or whatever they sit in anyway before they put it into the mill anymore. Sometimes, yeah. 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 The water yeah. Line, the Logs bending, you're probably thinner piece pieces of wood. Thinner pieces of wood, yeah. Yeah, and if you look at it, yeah, not as often. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I've seen four by fours that look like bows, you know. Uh, but, and that's oftentimes because they've been pressure treated. So they sit down and. Um, they send that stuff out, like the bent stuff. Yeah. I mean that's you can't sell it, you can't do anything with it. It's it's hard to it's hard to get it straightened back out. I mean you gotta work at something like that. Uh Procon we have we do like trays and we get so much bent material that we have this giant box and it's like overflowing. Of just uh, bent, over, unusable we, material. We were sit with like six years of unbent uh, like yeah. bent material that the company won't take back and give us new ones. Yeah. Sometimes you can take and, I mean, it depends on how badly you want it to, to try and save it. If you spray it down with the hose, band it all together, in the opposite way of the bow, you can pull it back. But you shouldn't have to, right? Because you bought it that way. So. We bought the material. It should be ready. Yeah, it should be right. And say most of the time, if you give a two-by-four, you're looking down the side of it to see if it's straight. Not oh, totally. The base of it, so. Yeah. yeah. When it's different, because some people will buy the bent wood for cheaper, like that's yeah, what they'll the, take that, the bent one just because they out of two by four. That's what that's what they do at Lowe's. They have like a yeah. pile of stuff of like bent oh uh, like two by four. Everybody's picked stuff. through it already. You got the straight one. Exactly. That's what I do, man. I'm I'll get the two by four there where I get them. Just a quick pro tip and we'll move away from wood. Um don't buy your lumber at Lowe's. Like that's just not where you buy lumber at. You buy a couple of two by fours there. You go to the lumber yard to buy yeah. lumber. Yeah, if you're yeah. buying big lumber, you go to the lumber yard. Lumber yard pretty good. I wouldn't even buy it there. If I'm buying, if I'm building a house, I'm never buying a board from Lowe's or Menards. No, it could be probably selling a small town. Some of them are a little rough. Yeah, that, yeah. So, it was all yeah. over crap there. Yeah. Well, um, you, can, you can get a special order for how much you want, like how, what you want cut at the lumber yard. Yeah, so I used to, and we got to move away, I used to be in the log business, um, and I made log siding. And so I would buy semi trucks of two by sixes and two by eights. I would mill them down into log siding and then band them back up, put them back on a semi truck and sell them. And, um, and I would every once in a while I'd get into a pinch and need to go buy a couple hundred boards and it would be seven o'clock at night. And so you take the trailer over to Lowe's and you just fish through a thousand boards to get a hundred boards, you know, and you're like, this is trash. But then, like, you go to some place like Herman Lumber or something, and then out of 100 boards, 98 of them are nice and straight, you know. But I would just take them. Like, they would never even go to Herman Lumber. They would just come straight from Canada to my house. Cool. Yeah, and so they would just send them on the semi-truck. But um, that's a way better way to buy. But anyways, all right, so let's look at some material types. If the first two numbers are 1 and 0, 1018, 1045, um, then that means one zero non-alloy material. That means you can weld on it, you can drill in it, you can tap in it, you can, um, you can expect it to rust. Uh, it's your 
It is your plain Jane. It is a uh, non-cruise control, stick shift. Um, what is going on? Every, it's the <laughs> plainest plane in the world. It is a white plain t-shirt. Nothing, no printing on it, no color, okay? So now, as we start to move into different numbers, different numbers, they don't necessarily tell us things, but going back to the chart starts to tell us things. Um, one, 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 two, four, zero, eight, eight, five, two, start to tell us chromium content, start to tell us some molybdenum content. Um, so 41, 40, uh, so 41 has 50.50 chrome content in it. So what's, what's chrome for? Wear resistance. It's different from bumper chrome, right? So. Huh? It's, the, it's different from chrome like that. I mean, it's the same but different. So that would be like a, a electroplated chrome coating. This is a chromium that's mixed into the materials as it's, as it's made. Does it make it look better or what is it? It's not. It doesn't have anything to do with the way it looks. It has everything to do with how wear resistant it is. So think about two pieces that work together. If you have a 1018, low carbon, no alloys, it will work, but it will wear into each other. If you have a 4140, it's more likely to last 10 times longer because it's, it's like got surface tension against it, right? So it's like, it's harder. It's the difference between, going back to wood, um, spruce pine fir and oak, right? So it's like the difference between Materials that are hard and soft. Okay. Do you use tungsten on rings a lot because it's harder to bend them and stuff? Tungsten on what kind of rings? Uh, I don't think so. I think that people use, make tungsten rings because they associate the word tungsten with, the, with something hard and fancy. You know? I was just wondering. Yeah, I, that's, that'd be my suspicion. Super heavy metal. That's basically. It's super heavy. Right. Like, so, super heavy. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever picked up a piece of tungsten. Yeah, 72 is like the only thing in that one row. I was just wondering why it's there. So, like, at our shop, we used to machine some parts that were like about this size out of tungsten. And they'd come in on a big old skid by themselves. And so one day, I come over there and I'm getting ready to go do some work on it. And I'm like, I go over to pick it up and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that is like 400 pounds, man. It's crazy. And so then what we just started doing was all the new guys, we'd be like, hey, man, can you go grab that? And they'd be like, oh, my gosh, it's so heavy. And you're like, oh, it's so heavy, man. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's super, super dense, you know. So that's what, that's what creates weight is the density of the material, right? Like, so down on the list here. packing all of those cells together. And, and so when you, go to, when you get to metrology later on in the semester, you'll talk a little bit more about it. But, like, everything's built kind of, you know what a lattice is, you know? Um, like, fence-type lattice work. So, so everything's kind of designed like that. And it's then how tight that the fence is, right? It's how tight everything's smashed together and, and needs to do its thing. Yes, sir? Someone's going to have to put up the gauge blocks. They're not going to want to be only two horses. Okay. Uh, Ed, was it Ed using? They are probably in that third classroom. They did not get. Was you, did you look? Did you look at the the red cabinet across from the bathroom? I don't know if he was using our game. Okay, I bet Ed used them in the classroom, third classroom down, and didn't put them back up. Yeah, Ed was using gauge blocks the other day. We're really trying to. So we used to keep that stuff in classrooms. Really trying to not keep that stuff in classrooms because of stuff like that. So. Um, all right, so take another band class tomorrow, and then another, and we got another lab. Uh, we we have another lab, okay. So here again, um, four-digit numbers. So here's your ten eighteen low carbon steel, um, and then comparison numbers to other countries of how it fits, um, and then or or how it matches with other materials because some. Um, they're, they're not exactly the same, but they can, they can kind of be substituted out for things. So like in the world that I came from, 
Uh, we made a lot of big die stuff. 23, 24 inch was pretty standard as far as the diameters. And a lot of times you build these rings out of like materials like S7, uh, but sometimes S7 wasn't available or you didn't have S7 on hand, so you could use D2. And so it kind of gives you the comparison charts on what you can use. If you don't have this, you can use this. Um, okay, so here's tool steels. Tool steels are, are really like our um, shearing, bending, shaping, forming types of material. 1018 um, is not that material because if you were to use it in a punch and die setup, it'd punch about five times and it would just be shot. So you gotta have something hard, you gotta have something heat treated and something heat treatable. Um, and then, um, so something like your cold work steels, your hot work steels, your high speed steels, uh, your shock resistance, so your S7, uh, your D2, your A2. And so it shows how you heat treat them and then how you, um, how you take care of them after the heat treatment, okay? So they all have a recipe on how they heat treat and then how they'll be quenched. So the heat treatment of something is when we will take it and um, we'll, we'll heat it up and we'll bring it to a certain temperature. It's gotta be higher than 1333. 1333 is the magic number on any kind of material. Anything under 13... What is that? That's such a weird number. So it is a weird number and here's why. So I use this example and I've gotta use a better example. Uh, and I'm going to try to make it so that it fits our culture today. Um, 1333 is the temperature where the molecules in the material get excited. And so at that point, they start just bouncing around. And I like to use this example. This isn't exactly what's happening, but this is kind of an example that I think that most people get. You take all these molecules inside of this material and it's all held together by, by vibrations and electricity, right? And so um, it gets heated up like that, 1333. Usually it goes to something like 1400 or 1700, depending on the material. And then you have this carbon inside of this material. So it's all just little, little bitty BBs kind of mashed together and they form this material. After you reach that, um, that designated recipe for heat treatment, at 1400 or 1700, the carbon essentially, um, just to give you kind of a, a, a visual on this, think about that carbon um, melting and liquefying and wrapping itself around all of those other cells. And that's the point where heat treatment happens. Your part just got hard at that point. Then you don't want it to slow cool down. So you dump it into something so you can lock that state. Quench it. Yeah. Into an oil, into a water. Water's rare, but or or air or gas or something. Uh, doesn't water sometimes make crack? Yeah. So if you have something like a, I'm not sure if it's on there. Yeah, there's a W. Um, so there there are some water hardening steels. And um and, and if that's the prescription for it, that's perfect. Um it's if it's not, you're gonna end up with a fracture in it. And is that a is that, is 1333? Is that going to be degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit on the? It's Fahrenheit. Yeah. Are you guys are not on metric system yet. We though? are not. No. Nope. Well, <laughs> I understand like the whole point of So you get it to the point where it's the alloy isn't isn't going to melt, but the carbon is going to kind so, of sort of. Yeah, and I don't know as I think that the melting idea is is the best example but it's yeah it's the only example that i got remember. to the point where the molecules are moving around fast enough to they're doing something like they're yeah. so we call it the 1333 is the upper transformation temperature so you have transformation that happens in there maybe maybe rather than using the term melting or moving like that we would use transforming okay. well, i understood it gets so hot that it hardens is that what you're trying, trying to tell well what it does is it gets so hot out of the steel on the inside and pulls it out? Or? Nope. So think about it like this. Um, it's, so unless we can magic school bus ourselves and get into it, it's, it's just kind of hard to see. Um, and so we used to have heat treat class where we spent a lot of in-depth time looking at this and microscoping it to death and stuff. But, but really what you need to know is once you hit the prescribed temperature, you've, you've reached a 
temperature for a certain amount of time to cause the molecules within that material to be excited enough to uh, transform into a different state. Okay, so they they phase change. Not quite to the melting point. Of the yeah. Water. So yeah. Not quite to that, but like before right. the melting point. Yeah. You so quench like boiling water from the. Yeah. yeah. And then when you so quench it, it's like stop. Like yeah. water to boiling water. Kind of so yeah, like that. So let's let's instead of using those terms of melting and consuming, let's use the phrases or the, the statements of um, transforming and phase changing, okay? So it's like they get to a certain, well, this is exactly, it's not like this, it's exactly like this. They, they get to this temperature, this prescribed temperature, and they turn into something else. You ever see gremlins? Everybody ever see gremlins? Okay, so, so it's, like, it's like you fed uh, the mogwai after midnight, okay? So it changes to the gremlin at that point. So, so when you heat the steel up, it's like you gave it pizza after midnight and it turned into a different state. Actually, you could get it wet too and then it won't then start shooting up babies. Yeah, and this, just an example. We're not, we're not, we are not <laughs> doing, <laughs> not gremlins. Like, we're not trying to, we're not literally gremlins, okay? And so then what you do is you get it to the place that you want, transformationally, and then you lock it down into it. Now, again, that can be air, oil, water. Um, it can be what a type. What will we use for our pump set? Our pump set. 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 Pump Hard to find a solid piece of liquid <laughs> oxygen, you know, while you, nobody walks into a room and goes, there's a piece of <laughs> oxygen <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> Left it there like yeah, that. <laughs> it right. hasn't melted yet. <laughs> Not like ice. So, um, yeah. But, um, and so, man, I'll tell you what, here's what I think is so crazy, is that the world that we live in is way more scientific than people think. You know what I mean? I mean, we just talked about phase-changing metals. And people on the other side of campus, I'm not dogging them. They're going, oh, man, they're over there, um, you know. Tucked away in their yeah, shops. All dirty, wrenching on stuff. And I'm like, that's actually not true at all. Yet? Yeah. yeah, I tell people all the time when they do tours in here, um, I say, man, if you're sweaty and dirty in here, that's because you fell down running to the candy machine. You know, you should have no reason that you should that should happen. So... Um, so there's like molecular stuff that we're doing, but welding's the same way. Yeah, they just don't. Your rod ain't right. Yeah, right down to that level. Right. But the, you're, you're doing the exact same whatever. thing, right? Like right. you're, yeah. When, by electricity, you're creating you're melting metal to get it. Yeah, basically. you're bringing something to about 2,400 degrees to get it to a melting point, point. Um, and then you're adding in um, similar metals to bond it together. And then to cool it down. Every rod has its own number. Yeah, it's way more scientific. It looked good too. Yeah. 1042. Yeah. Metal. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and 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 we can go thousand rabbit trails on <laughs> on temperatures. All kinds of welding and all kinds of stuff like that. But what I'm saying is, so like when we get to our punches, so that material is O1. Okay. So it's an O. It's an oil hardening material. We're going to get it to a certain temperature. We're going to hold it there for a certain amount of time. After that, you're going to take it out. You're going to quench it in a quench oil. After 30 seconds or one minute, depending on which oil it is. Where do we do this? Do you have a machine that we heat it up in, or do I go to hold Microwave. it? Microwave. <laughs> basically? We, we wrap it in tin no. foil. We wrap it in tin foil to make it's sure. It's already metal, dude. <laughs> you know, you'd have to wrap it in. So, but we, do, we can wrap it, okay? So we have a, where have you been getting your chucks out of? It's the heat treat station. Do we do that in here? Because won't it like heat up the shop a lot? Yeah. Really? Totally, totally consumed. Fire brick, ceramic. Uh, it's actually gas infused. Or, uh, not lit, but it's it's just like a big like kiln, a pretty much. It's it's, it's a, about a ten by ten. Nope, it's not a forge. It's not forge and fire. We're not making swords. Um, so it's about a ten by ten oven. It's a ten inside of a ten by ten, and we can take argon and inject argon into it. And you know why it doesn't explode? 
10,000 bonus points when argon won't explode. No fire. It's your, uh, well, no, you're right. There is no fire. Is it lack of oxygen? Or nope. Argon not combustible? Argon's inert. It doesn't explode. It doesn't catch on fire. It's 10,000 points. Let's go. You didn't say the word inert. I didn't have to. I said, it, I said it's not combustible. So there's lots of gases that are inert. So that means that... Maybe the gasoline for a car won't light from a cigarette butt. That's different. Um, exactly. That's really suffocation. Yeah. Exactly. Like, it's a super dangerous game because if an ember falls off, it's a super. Honorary flick, of, flick one of your gas tank. Yeah. So, like this summer, I did a lot of work on my gas tank on my boat. And so I would just go take it to the gas station, fill the tank up to the very top. And that's a bad idea. Real four inch hole. No, you're, you oh, no, no oxygen. You want to leave no place, no no place for vapor. I thought you were good, just gonna like try to pick it up and put it back in there. I was like, oh my gosh, this gas tank is freaking. Yeah, it's uh sixty gallons. Yeah. I was about to say, if you're just trying to pick it back up and put it in there when you filled it, <laughs> sorry, you're not gonna get it. I mean, that gas tank. It's as big as that toolbox. Yeah, that, there's. I told my mom that deck book. We got to tear those seats and everything out. Yeah, this is this is this is not coming out. <laughs> um, but yeah, you see, so you fill it up so that there's no vapor, and then I mean, you could literally take a flame and shoot it straight into it, and won't do anything unless it catches the vapor of it. Because yeah, the vapor is what vapor, vapor is what's flammable. Yeah. yeah. So, so heat treat does not radiate external heat. It does. So. It's not a fire though. So it's electric. Uh, but there are gas ones out there, so sometimes you can see that. So ours are electric, fire brick. Um, they've got some controls on them, some safeguards in there. So you turn it on, it's on a timer, so the oven's only going to stay on for about an hour or two hours. And then if you're going to heat treat longer than that, you're going to need to come back and reset the timer on it. Uh, why I have it like that is because students have a tendency to heat treat something, go to lunch, not come back, and then their stuff is in the oven for like all day long. Right, and it just destroys it, or um, it brings um, some. You know, it. I don't want to burn the building down. Right, like right. like it's really don't. Yeah, that, really do want to do that. Yeah, that really isn't that really isn't a factor. That can be. So so now you said something about foil wrapping, um, talking about in the microwave. But what we will do sometimes is we will foil wrap. We'll use a stainless steel foil wrap. And why, what we want to do is we want to keep the oxygen out of the material because the oxygen um, affects the surface of the part. So here's how you do this. This is so cool. This is the coolest thing in the world, I think. This is science, baby. It's awesome. So what we'll do. Is that just cool, bud? Let it get, yep, get on there. Um, so we'll take and make this little envelope out of the stainless steel foil wrap. We'll put our parts inside of there and we'll put a piece of paper in there. And then we'll... Tight, we'll seal it up and then we'll heat treat it. Why would you put a piece of paper in there? I bet you could. What it's made out of? What, I mean, what, it's, what it's made out of? No. Why, yeah, out of any steel that you're going to heat treat and wrap, um, why would you put a piece of paper in there? What? Does the paper ignite and that's what can cause like the internal heat inside of it? Yep. The paper will ignite. It'll go up in flames real quick. Is it, to, is it to initiate the heat? Nope. It can get heat without it. <laughs> no idea. When a paper ignites inside of that envelope, it sucks all the oxygen out of it. Ah, fence. Isn't that awesome or what? Weird. Isn't that how? Isn't that Because you don't want because oxygen affects the surface of the part. So think about if you're heat treating knife blades. That's why they do that in uh, some of those containers with the arms in it. They put a piece of paper in to take all the oxygen out of it real quick. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, I'm not sure it's sharp on. Uh, it's in the make aluminum foil. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some stainless steel foil wrap. It's like aluminum foil. It's a little thicker. It's insanely sharp. So be very, very super expensive. They, they literally take like this super sharp thing and then just like go around. Like a big, oh, okay. yeah. Go like a big, around a big cylinder type deal. And then they just like shave off a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually kind of, it's really satisfying and cool. So there's a process, and, and, and again, when we had heat treat metallurgy as a class, we used to show a process called tinning, where you just take like a thick piece of metal and you just keep shrinking it down and working it so that it's like 
a tin can or like an aluminum can. I mean, it's a really insane process. It takes miles of, of, of process to get it thinned down that. That's pretty crazy. That? I was talking about vacuum, like the vacuum shield. Oh, vacuum, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay, so then there's the process of casting and cast iron. Uh, so cast iron is really a non, it's, it's a, it's a non-alloyed um, material. Uh, it's, it's really stable. So like engine blocks used to be made out of cast iron because they were just super stable. A whole car made out of cast iron. That thing will never break down. <laughs> it was super heavy. I don't think yeah, it would move. Uh, so then you can cast shapes. Um, a lot of the parts that we machined at the shop that I came from were castings because they're just so much cheaper because you can you can remove a ton of material from it without having to do the machining process. A billet, which would be a solid slug, um, you, you're, you're, you're losing half of your value in chips, right? Like if you can get it down close in shape and then all you got to do is take off an eighth of an inch all the way around it, it's just it just makes more economic sense. Yeah, things are very bad because they don't they make them very lazy. It depends on where you get your castings at. We get like there we get a batch of like six hundred of them, and there's like probably three hundred fifty that are. Yeah, well, but they came from China, and some nine year old kids did them. So I mean, you know, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> but, uh, like I've got some I've got a great story of people who I know who have been in. Um, Chinese uh, boundaries, and it is a it is a completely different environment. So, anyways, you get it. You start with the casting like this. You end up with the finished part like this. Uh, but remember, this isn't necessarily a steel. It can be a cast steel. You can cast steel. You can cast brass, bronze, aluminum, whatever you want to do. You can. There's a lot of casting that you can do. So, numbering system for cast iron is great. Cast iron is white. Cast iron. Gears are made of like transmissions, ain't it? Yeah, sometimes, um, it, you know, and really, again, with the stability, they're super stable. You're not going to have a lot of flex and warp of them. Um, and really, the way that they break is really, it's, really it, it's good. It's good for it, right? Like you need a break point on certain things, and and certain times, if it doesn't have um, some type of U joint in there to intentionally break, a gear tooth is a good place for it to break. I mean, depending on because of, because you're trying to keep it from breaking more other more more things down the road. So you grind them, you'll tear the hell out of them. Yeah, you'll find them. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if that's really <laughs> until you find it, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. So um, in the same way with heat treatment, you can do two different things. You can normalize or anneal. So to bring something normalized is to even out the pressure or the tension, the surface tension and the internal tension of the material. Kind of bring it back to, I use the example sometimes with a statement of, bring it back to factory specs. Not exactly, but, but just for, for our case, that's close enough. Annealing will bring it back um, or will draw it down softer than what it was. So like, I'll, I'll take a piece of, um, let's just say we've got some 4140 pre-hard. Starts out 28 to 32. Um, I'm machining it and I'm finding out, man, I got to do some other operations on this and it's going to be, I need to do something softer. I can take it and heat it up, slow cool it back down, go do my machining operations on it, um, bring it to size or not, depending on whatever the things happen to be to it, then put it back in the oven, bring it back up to the temperature that needs to be and then reheat treat it. Right, which that isn't the most effective way, but if you needed to, you could. Right. right, exactly. Yeah, so typically my best scenario would be to do it before it's heat treated. Yeah. But if something came along where I needed to do that, let's just say, so um, I'm working on a big die and we've got to put, we've got to do some modifications to it. I can put it in the heat treat oven. I can anneal it, do my work to it, then reheat treat it if I need to. You have to heat treat stuff to heat treat other things. I have to heat treat stuff to heat treat other things. Like, you know, tools that you're using? Um, so, like, your high-speed steel um, is M2, usually, uh, and it's heat treated. Yeah. So, like, form tools, they're heat treated. Uh, carbide, carbide is a powder that gets heat treated as it's compressed. What so, is so cool about carbide? I hear everybody saying it's, like, the best way to get a straight cut, all this crazy stuff. 
Yeah. I mean, it's the tools that you guys cut with. It's the. Yeah, but like there's the saw tips and all kinds of stuff. They're just harder and they hold the edge longer. Yeah. They, they, but they won't hold as sharp of an edge. Who use diamonds in the blades? <laughs> wear resistance. Thought they have them. Absolutely. Wear resistance. Typically, if you're doing like diamond stuff like that, it's usually on like um, really tile. Really hard material. It's abrasive. T right. Things are abrasive. Yeah, so like concrete sauce, um, tile sauce, stuff like that. Um, our dressers on our surface grinders, uh, so those wheels are abrasive wheels. So you have to have something more abrasive than the abrasive. So we use a diamond cluster um, dresser on it. And so it's just industrial diamonds and they're just harder. And then they stay, they just help form that straight edge on it. So, yeah, it's really, it's pretty unique, man. There, there's way more science in here than you could ever think of. Diamonds to mine diamonds. How did the first diamond come on? Great question. Yeah. So I'm going to use it. It's really hard. How do you cut diamond with an iron pickaxe? So, so a lot of times you're processing when you're mineral processing like that. You're not. Okay, so like getting the diamonds out of the ground, is that what the part that you're talking about? Yeah. Like you, you're, you're loosening the material around the diamond. Right, you're giving the, like, whatever it's cemented in or whatever. The, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Or, so, like, if you were to, like, shape a diamond down to a shape so you can use it, like a, like a drill bit, or like a bit that would use the wood stuff. So, industrial diamonds like that are pulverized and chunked into things. So diamonds are super brittle. So the downside of the diamond is that it's really brittle. Because it's, it's has so much pressure. So much pressure. It's really sharp, right? Well, it's not even that it's really sharp, it's that it's really dense. It's hard to break, but once you break, I mean, it shatters yeah, that's why I really call you guys kind of my diamond class. Yeah. Oh yeah? I don't know if I should take that as an insult or a compliment. Okay. Um, go ahead and go grab it out there. Are we with? Yeah, you guys are kind of my diamond class. Um, so. And, I don't know. It depends on how you take it, I guess. Yeah, so that would... Yeah, so then literally you would be cold. Yeah. Get it? Yeah. Because my head's dense, but there's nothing in there. Cold? Not. I get it. Yes, thank you. I was, I was like, somebody's going to... <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, so uh, lots of pressure um, and diamond in the rough. Sometimes, so I am cold. There you go. So if we, if we want to try to take and make industrial diamonds, we take um, diamond fragments or diamonds that won't be used for things like jewelry or, or lasers or other things like that. Um, just we're going to, they're, they're typically chunks sometimes they're dust but they would be smaller chunks they would have no they're kind of like um, misshapen chunks kind of like that they take i don't know i'd call it the seconds industrial diamonds are just a different grade of diamond okay you know when you're looking for a diamond for your girlfriend or boyfriend it's a um you're looking at a clarity type um thing like that so so different different kinds of things going on there so in Yeah, we're using it because it's so dense that it holds an edge for a really long time. That's why we care. With the diamond in. What's that? You propose with the diamond in. No one says will say yes. You, first of all, she probably won't. Secondly, uh, diamond in mount seems pretty expensive, and that's going to be odd to have on her finger. It's cheap. I think the first one's going to stop you right there. So. All right, so let's talk. I'm in, babe, I promise. I, I, I was barely, we were really just friends to start with. And so, um, all right, let's talk about aluminums. And so aluminums are oftentimes alloys. We use a 6061 aluminum alloy all the time, oftentimes called an aircraft aluminum. Um, I would not call it that. I would just call it a 6061 aluminum. Seven, there's 7,000 series aluminum, 6,000 series aluminum. So do you consider them to use it to make the aircraft? What's that? So the aircraft aluminum is kind of like saying, because I'm not sure what I would relate it to. It's a really vague term. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It's like, it's like, like, like 80% black and 52% angles. 
That would be something that you could do, yeah. Or you could even use like, a, this is a high performance boat. That means a lot of things to a lot of different people. You know what I mean? Supercharged. Exactly. High performance for what? So same thing here when you're saying this is aircraft aluminum. It's carbon what fiber. What kind of aircraft aluminum is what you're talking about? It's carbon fiber. It's not very high performance for very long. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so just in the world of non-ferrous materials, we're talking about aluminum alloys. We're talking about magnesium. Anybody know what is one super common characteristic of magnesium? is not, but it has a really um, quick ability to catch on fire. And once it catches on fire, it's almost wow. impossible to stop. Yeah. Um, Don't they use magnesium in like whatever, I forgot what it's called, but to make holes in metals that are really dense? I don't know. Magnesium. magnesium. I know something is really hot with magnesium. Yeah, magnesium is in a lot of stuff. Magnesium burns really hot. So like every once in a while you'll see aircraft carriers that they'll have something catch on fire and they'll roll it off the side of the aircraft carrier. That's because it has a high magnesium content in it and they can't get it to stop burning. Oh, stop burning. So you just dump it off the side, you know. And so that's not wasteful. That's preserving the rest of the thing, right? You know, so it's you pull the other magnesium from catching on fire. Should go down just because one thing's on fire. All that is flammable. Super flammable. Yeah. So it just ignites. Yeah. So like you could be machining magnesium and it could ignite. Couldn't it would be it, a rare. So Shouldn't it ignite just because of heat? Yeah, just ignite. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it quite works like that. But it, it could ignite just from heat and not like an open flame or anything like that. Yeah, um, heat and pressure. Yeah, heat and pressure. So like if you were... Um, like say I was drilling and someone was like drilling wrong. And they were trying so to drill all the way through. Yeah, I was doing it. Yeah, so. I was drilling wrong, and I was just trying to drill all the way through it, and a lot of heat was happening. It's sure. going to catch on fire. Yeah. Super dull drill. Um, and then you went and got, grabbed some cutting oil, but you didn't grab cutting oil, and you grabbed motor oil. Uh, and it ignited it, you know. I mean, like everything. Um, nine? That's fine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you know, just whatever. You know I mean? We can try it. We are not going to try it. No, you can. We, have magnesium? we don't. We have. No, there's no reason that we would ever have anything. I think you're lying you can time. YouTube it. You can YouTube it. I think at at another time, other than class time, you can totally do that. All right. So then, nope. Um, so you have your uh, non-ferrous materials, which are copper, brass, and bronze. Your titaniums um, and your super alloys. Inconel alloy would be things that are super alloys. Uh, insanely dense materials, oftentimes heavy, depends on what it is. Uh, copper, brass, and bronze would be all in that family of goldish type things, uh, but not necessarily <coughs> just like that. Uh, thank you. This is dynamite. <coughs> um, so again, um, titanium is just a mixture of materials, right? And that's what all of these things are. It's just a just a batch of materials mixed together. It's all granular coming together. Um, and it, it's really, it's a recycled car and a sewing machine ground down together, adding some additional um, chromium to it to make something else. And that's all we're doing um, on a much more um, you know, complex scale. The other day that our metals keep getting worse and worse. They, they get... Um, the metals, I should say. Yeah, so it's like... It's kind of like um, well, uh, using a drill bit over and over again instead of getting a new one. Like it's not going to be as good as when you sharpen it. Down, right? Mine are. Yours are? Yeah, I know how to sharpen a drill. Oh my gosh. If you don't know how to sharpen one. Yeah. I know. I, um, <laughs> it's, it's like this. It's like Thanksgiving. Um, it's like eating Thanksgiving dinner um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Worse when the in-laws come to. It just, it starts to degrade. Right now. So, so what they do is they keep adding different things to it to try to, and they kind of, they're kind of freshening it back up, you know. So, but there's nothing wrong with doing that because you have people who are chemists who are really doing the right things to make those materials work out right. Are they the same as when they were virgin? They're not, but, um, but they, they just are something different now. So, all right, um, here's some alloys, just 
brass, bronze, um, some of those non-ferrous materials. Um, we'll stop on that one. Um, we've spent way too much time where we. So since when you're looking, uh, now that you're looking for the next one, when you guys were on tungsten, I held my tongue before we started another conversation about it. But the United States had a an idea to put a satellite in the air, not like really a satellite, but they were going to fill it with tungsten rods that were 10 foot tall, and were going to use it to drop down on people, oh, yeah. drop down from space and hit. Uh, place. It was real in the Cold War, like they were thinking about doing it. But then they realized it was stupid that way. because how much money tungsten costs and building a nine foot pole and buy something like that is not worth dropping. I mean, when you drop that something that big from that high, I mean, it's going to make a big explosion. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna be, yeah. If you drop a quarter off the Empire State Building, it's going to kill them. Yeah. 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 Unless you jump when you catch it. <laughs> Actually, it's not true. They have a maximum speed. Terminal velocity. It won't kill no one. Oh, what is that? But it will hurt you. Yeah. Oh, it'll hurt you pretty bad. So, the tungsten idea. Did you guys ever see the G.I. Joe movies? That's that's one of the plots of G.I. Joe. Oh. That, that, so, where did I say Steven Seagal when I said G.I. Joe? <laughs> that's like saying, I want chocolate ice cream. Yeah, I'll have a taco. <laughs> We're talking about two different things. <laughs> this is why we can't get through. Okay, so. One will make it too fast. Right. This is why you're diamonds. Okay. All right, so. We have all the stupid questions right now. That pretty well covered. We covered, really, the heat treatment and what we were talking about there. Let's see if there's anything. Seagal was a bad person, dude. <laughs> oh, my. I think we're not doing unit seven now. We're going to switch to eight. So we talked about, we, we spent an absorbent amount of time talking about heat treatment. All right. So with this, we need to start talking about our, our maintaining of our machines. At nine o'clock, we have to go out for a picture, and I need you guys all in your shirts. If you're not in your shirt, you're probably just not going to be in the picture. Damn. Man, it's not my fault you people suck. <laughs> you not in shirt yet. I understand. I Three weeks. One thing I learned in life, never depend on someone to do their job correctly. Hey man, where are all those scholarships at? When do they come in? I'm broke right now. I got like $18. I am trying to do that stuff. I will do the best I can. I, I We worked on it last week quite a bit. I'm not sure why the wheel turns so slow. I really am not. Um, I have packed PB&J today. No McDonald's. That's what I brought to you. Yeah. Okay. First of all, y'all are poor money managers, okay? I'm really bad at managing. No, you are. No, 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 no. I make sure to get cheap something at McDonald's. I literally make $85 a month at child support and everything. So I'm doing okay. Yeah. Like, y'all spend way too much time at places that consume your money. Hey, man, I go Things that you don't need. And then I go home. I don't, I don't spend any money on anything I don't really want, okay? So that, no one does. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, like, no one does that. Like if I really like, I bought a PC. It was really hard for me to spend five hundred dollars on something. Like I like, I can spend twenty dollars here, twenty dollars there, but it adds up. I'm good at spending a little bit of money a lot of times and wasting all my money. I spend but eight bucks on my food at smaller. McDonald's. I think it's odd that you put. I'm really good at doing this, as though that's a, that's a pro. Well, okay. I'm really good at wasting money. Yeah. At, whenever we go to McDonald's, I spend eight dollars on three things and a drink. Right. How much is it yeah, to buy one? I don't spend eight dollars a day eating. A, a, the complete day. Was Twenty bucks. He's got whole wheat bread, some PB and J, and a couple of granola bars and just now to I have an apple and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> so to me, I got peanut butter and jelly is expensive. So is bread. No. <laughs> <laughs> that eight dollars could set you for the whole week. Right. A loaf of bread, a Thing of jelly and oh, thing of bread. peanut butter. You have ramen noodles. That's eight dollars for the. I can. I can eat probably. I bet I could stretch that for two weeks. Eight dollars. Eight dollars by if I if I bought a loaf of bread, peanut butter, and jelly, and let's just say I had to buy um, a plastic knife along with it. I just splurged. Um, eight dollars <laughs> last me two weeks. Okay. Because I too am really good at spending money that I don't. Need. You can make with ramen. I swear to God, you'll be the best ramen maker ever. Yeah. You go to prison with ramen. You learn how to make all different shit with it. Yeah, it's true. That is true. Um, 
So anyways, yeah, don't be poor spenders, okay? So, so go to prison to learn how to yep. make food. Got it. No. <laughs> I feel like right before that, I gave you a better example. I like that. four months that when I get paid, I want to do something real nice for it, go get some. That's why I have tattoos. No. As soon as I get money, I want to spend it. That's why I have I'm not, tattoos. I'm not that. Real nice That's 10 bucks to get you something. That's it. Right. So go... Go to the grocery store rather than going to McDonald's. Yep. You know the last time I was at McDonald's? Like eight months ago. And I was there like yesterday. I know. <laughs> I was there probably every day this week. Yeah. I mean, McDonald's is, you know. I'll tell you what, them buffets are worth like the $12. You no, know. they're not. That, no, that is a ridiculous statement. So th- these businesses aren't going, hey, if we do the buffet, we can probably break even. It's 72 cents of food. Again, and you're you're like you're like oh this fourteen dollars the best fourteen I'm gonna get my money's worth I love the person who says oh they're losing money on me no they're not uh, I know they're not losing money on me but I get I, I get my fill you know what you know what a drink costs a restaurant well it depends if you get water I always get water okay let's assume it's not water let's assume a large we're way off topic we got to get back to it a large soda okay a large soda Cup, ice, product, lid, straw, labor, 25 cents. That's why car washes sell everything in those machines at the car wash. Because they get them for pennies on the dollar and they sell them for three bucks. 25 cents out of that that drink. Like, and you're you're going, man, a buck 25, that's not bad. It's totally bad. That's why cans of soda used to be 50 cents all the time. They made a dollar. They made like five times. Oh, no, plus they charge us for tax on that. They don't keep the tax. <laughs> <Keep> the tax. <laughs> tax is a transferable amount. Bro, you need to learn some math. No, like, oh, I, I, I guarantee you McDonald's doesn't pay as much tax as they should. I guarantee they do. They <laughs> definitely are. McDonald's is not going down for tax evasion. <laughs> no. They right, have an Chevy, entire... Chevy and Dodge about did. Yeah. So some of those things happen because of some other... Things that go on. Yeah, well, Ford sucks. So, okay, let's, let's, let's talk about what we, we got. So, we've got to be nine o'clock and be out there. Um, we are in eight, module eight. Um, and we're talking about. What? I'm just reading the slide. I'm just caught up with you. Okay. I'm caught up. Okay. So, um, over here, you have these one shot pumps. These are on the mills. You pull the thing out, it's got metering uh, jets on it that will push the oil out to all of the machines. When you come up to a machine, one of the things that you want to watch for is, does this thing have oil in it, lubrication, all the things that it needs. And that's for the system itself, not for where, like, putting down yeah. so, job, right? Exactly. Yeah, different from what we're talking about, like, cutting oils and stuff like that. Well, Meter, metering jets in there. Um, here's a... Sight glass for the lathe. You should see that oil kind of sloshing around through there. Um, Can we get some more of that? Can we get that thing shape thing out to look at the viscosity of it? Um, it really, this really won't be a viscosity type thing. Oh, they already have it set. I, yeah. I didn't get to use it that Yeah, yet. typically viscosity is in coolant. Um, and the machines that we're in right now, we won't. Now, when you move on to the CNC side of things, you'll be in viscosity or um, uh, in, in um, refractometer all every day. Several different types of little oiling ports on the machine. The idea is you want to make sure that you're maintaining the machine because if you don't, it will not hold size. It will not be repeatable. It will not be in good shape. It will not be usable. And I mean, if you don't take care of the piece of equipment, it will not take care of you. It will be destroyed um, within the first day. Hey, how are you? Oh, hey. Fuck your life. Bing bong. It's past our time to take a picture. No, she said nine. Oh, she said nine now? I thought she said 845. It's 845. Brian, I got my truck today. What'd you get? No, I I, I drove my truck. Oh. <laughs> Are you staying? I don't know yet. <laughs> I just find a different opportunity that I could learn faster. 
There's some boxes in Kansas City, it's like a couple of weeks long and they keep you all the same food stuff. Sure, make the hammer for me and then give it to me just so I can have it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm on the phone. 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 I'm Yeah. And John's just dying laughing. I really I never buy games as soon as they come out because then they do. Ten well. minutes, we are going to go to um, do the picture. So, all right, let's keep talking maintenance and we'll get moving on here. Uh, finally, Maruka has come to work on our horizontal, and and I get it. We are a lower priority than people who are in production. So, you know, because we're not. We're not we're in production. Oh. That'd be a lie. We're pro we're, we're producing. Uh, we're making. Uh, Producing okay. students. Producing students. Producing, yeah. We're producing people. We're making Roblox. We are. So here, this is called a gib. A gib is kind of a multi-angled wedge that helps to keep um, the sliding piece on the base um, in this dovetail. And so it's adjustable where you push it in or pull it back out to give it the right amount of tension against that. So as the, as the machine wears, you push the gib in a little bit more. Um, if you take the machine off and say you re-scraped a ways, you'll readjust the gib how it sits in there. But that's the thing that if it starts to get too tight, you might loosen the gib up a little bit. If it starts to get too loose, you tighten the gib up a little bit. Before you do stuff like that, we need to talk. 
I don't want you to just <laughs> and then I see a whole bunch of premium wear. I don't think I need, you know, to get into this. I think you're right. right. You probably got it. Yep. Right. Cutting fluids. We talked before. Um, WD forty is not a cutting fluid. It is a water and it's an everything fluid. It's a water displacement tool. I mean, if you were dying, I could drink WD forty. I don't I don't think you can. That might kill you. You can do all of those things. But just like you can swallow dynamite. Right. You, mm -hmm. The end result shortly after is not awesome. But you can. You, you'll be crapping your intestines. I mean, it's just like you can jump out of an airplane without a parachute. <laughs> and there will be no effect to it. The landing is different. Right? So, I mean, it's like... It, it changes things. So, so WD-40 is really a water displacer. It's really not even meant to help um, with, with keeping things from rusting, but it's, it has a tendency to crystallize. When we're talking about cutting fluids, we're typically talking about things that are um, sulfur-based. And um, there's lots of different ways to, to do these. Our primary cutting fluid is cool tool. Okay? So... It's, um, we use a general cool tool on all of our materials. Um, there are things out there that are a little more specific, like Tap Magic, uh, and then Aluminum Tap Magic. Um, and so Aluminum Tap Magic has a, has a, it can really irritate your skin and stuff, so we try to stay away from some of those things. Um, our coolant that's in our machines, on our CNC's, that is, uh, it, it's not like an antifreeze coolant, because I, I had never made that association, but somebody had said something to me one time. They were like, so is that like an antifreeze? And I'm like, oh, it's coolant, the same words. So it is to help with chip evacuation and to keep the machining function there, um, the application from getting heated. Okay, so we're trying to keep everything at an even temperature. If you can't keep good coolant on a cutting edge, it's better to have no coolant on it at all. Because what you do is you hit my, you create micro fractures on there. So that carbide's spinning around and you're ch -ch 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 with the spray bottle. And so that as a carbide's going around, it's going hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, and it's just cracking. And then you're like, well, these inserts suck because they always crack. And you're like, dude, you are actually intentionally cracking them as you're doing that. Okay, so like we used to do that all the time in the shop. We would keep a bottle of Cool Tool there and we'd run the mill and we'd just be like, ch -ch 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 -ch. and we would actually think that. We'd be like, these inserts are kind of crappy. And then what we found out is we were, we were better to not use that and just blast air across it and to evacuate the chip that way. And we were like, oh my gosh, these inserts are way better. We changed our process. Operator. It was operator error, it really was. Okay. Um, sulfurized, chlorinated cutting oil. Um, yes, drinkable. Reproductions uh, are not what you want. Yeah, not recommended would be a great way to say that. Yes, sir. I realized I was about to take Oh. Here's the refractometer. We've used it. Most of us have used it for coolant at least. Um, we try to keep ours between 5 and 10. It looks on... exactly like that. What's that? Like that gauge. Yeah, it looks exactly like that. Yeah. So here's a, a cold air blast. So it's not always gonna be just a liquid coolant sprayed on something. So there's an air mist, um, all kinds of different ways. Say, that thing. Air mist. So it cools stuff down? Yep. Well, it cool the operator down. I'm gonna move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> AC right there. A dry lube that you can use on like bandsaw blades and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're you're totally fine. Totally. Um, open house. Before I go into a meeting this afternoon, have you gotten any plans for that yet, or are you just the twenty second? Uh huh. Um, yeah. So we've got my diamond class will be here. Um, doing um, in their uniforms. I in think. always in their uniforms. He would be in his, but he they, he hasn't got it. He's oh. he's bigger, so. Yeah, yeah. So big sizes have been on back order. I had to ship it from Indonesia. Grill cover company. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But, uh, so yeah, they're going to be here. We're going to be running. We've got a handful of demo parts that we're making. All the machines should be moving and shaking. So. Okay, so, but you don't have anything that's going to make people want to come inside this building? We do not have cheerleaders or a Haas race car outside, no. Okay. I'm going to work on that then. Yeah, we need some fireworks. Okay, do you have anything that you can put in the lobby that will make people want to come? Uh, uh, I don't think that mannequin is, I don't think it has the, the draw that you might think it does. Um, so it scare me sometimes. I'm like, it, is, that? it is scary. Um, I don't, I haven't. What do you guys think are going to get people here? Oh my, man. I can't well, well, <laughs> I know food. Yeah, okay, we, well, we do have food trucks. Okay, food we, trucks we, should, we should have a, like a robot we a operating. We need a T-Rex out of CNC part. We need a CNC, a T-Rex. Big one, human size one, and like. You think we can do that in like four days? Yeah, four weeks. It's next month. Oh, yeah. Can I put that on the spreadsheet, or should I wait? That's. We're gonna spitball that one around just a little bit more. Uh, Ed thought about making like a pumpkin. You, you know how? Hang on, hang on, one second. Finish what you were saying. Remember, I went through the jingle on the green. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I went whenever they made that coin on the CNC machine was what got me in here. Okay. So I have. Almost, I think we have five students who are in the program strictly because of Jingle and Green. Sweet. I, I'm, I was like, what? So I, I they, yeah, so I know you can get them in the program if we can get them over here, yeah. but I got to get them over here. Because they said he was going to raffle off. Like if you put alcohol in this building somewhere, yeah. <laughs> everybody will be here for but that, that. Do what? What did you say? Put alcohol anywhere and people will be here. <laughs> alcohol. Anyone twenty one and over? Two really great ideas: alcohol and a T Rex. We're gonna so. spitball that one. <laughs> I'll put them on the list. Uh, you can put them on the spreadsheet, but yeah, I don't think that's beer, if you had a beer truck and a concert, we could fill this place up. But I think something cool that we can like see that we built here and set it out there. I was just making up a random animal, something cool that you know we could see and see the machine. It wouldn't take you know forever. I mean, we could all work on it. I mean, you realize if we see and see a big T Rex, it might take a while. Yeah, we're gonna spitball it. We don't. We don't have any good ideas. If you have a concert and okay. beer, everybody be here. Probably just. Yeah. What we need. Does anybody know any famous singers? I'll take nine or somebody. I actually know a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Shaman's Harvest? He's a running band from Jet City. They're, they're world famous now. They go on world tours. I call ski masks. <laughs> I'll work on it. Okay. Hey, uh, if you guys seriously though have some ideas, try to get a cheap player. You can get them in that building. And if, if Justin tells me, then I know they're vetted a little. So. Right. Yeah. Try to get a cheap player up here. You can definitely pursue that route. If I get it, I get money. If you get that, I'll give you a C. We need to have Travis. Sounds Kelsey. good. We need to have Travis Kelsey redeem himself with like an MMA fighter or someone that. Yeah, because he got a suplex. My mom's ex boyfriend's actually the head doctor at the Chiefs program. Midget boxing. We might be able to do something. I don't know that that's appropriate to say. <laughs> we are on video. <laughs> there are some things. I'm going to let you guys bet some yeah. of that. We're gonna, we're gonna, we'll work on that at another time. Micro wrestling. How about yeah. that? Okay. Well, we've got to stop. So, okay. We're going to, I'm going I'm to do one minute of. Um, this is a, like a, this is almost like a deodorant that goes on, stays on the saw blade for a while to help lubricate the blade on there. Exactly. Absolutely. She did that kind of thing. So here's the mist again. The oh, one above that one, Wilson? The, what was that? It? Yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, it was all of our machining tools and everything. All of our CNC's. Our, 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 uh, they don't have much iron. Rust so what? we typically machine 6061 aluminum. Um, we do machine some steels. Mm -hmm. But what we found, so when I started, we machined a lot of steel, not very much aluminum. I was just wondering, because with that much steel, cooling, steel. that much cooling, I was just wondering, how is our machine not going to get rusty? Ever? So these, these, are, these have enough oil content in them that they don't rust. Okay. So, but you got to have your ratios right. Because if you if you have if your ratio gets out and it gets too much water in it, you will start to see rust happening inside the machine. Yeah, that happen. Definitely yeah, cannot happen. It won't cool properly. Yeah, and yeah. So it won't um, it won't evacuate the chip out fast enough. It won't do what it's supposed to. They are set between five and ten for a reason. So 
Um, if you can't go, thicker is better on that, and, and you, you just, it just isn't the way it works. I think that one's also just nasty to look at. It'll also melt or li uh, lift the paint off the machine, so we don't do that. That's why I was wondering if it's the paint that's keeping it from getting rusty or what? Um, some of it, but I mean, most of your machine surfaces are, are cast iron, so cast iron isn't isn't quick to rust. I mean, it, it can, but we, I mean, it, I was just wondering if that's a lot of fluid. It'll, down, it'll, you know, wire brush off pretty fast. Um, some of our other stuff are tool steels, and they're less likely to rust. But, I mean, a lot of those surfaces are just exposed metal. And so at, at certain times, we'll take and we'll, if we're going to be gone for like a week or something, we'll oil everything down before we leave so that it doesn't get like that. Are going to do that before? Like, we do it before um, we leave for Christmas break. Yep. So we'll be uh, off for a month. Like with that. So what? We're going to be for a month? During December, you're gone for almost a month. Like the, um, to the, like the 17th, the 17th. Yeah. So, I need to get a spring break. So, I'm gonna stop the video, but um, okay. So, Whatever, you have all these ideas recorded. Uh, I we do. We definitely <laughs> have a lot of your all statements recorded.